Hey everyone, this is Brayden from the Catechumen. If you know much about my story as a Catholic convert, you'd know that I come from the Baptist non-denominational tradition. About a year ago, I posted a video called My Story where I kind of go through the details of that. But as I now looking back, uh, consider my mental conversion, what sort of things took place and, and sort of rationalize it and put it into an argument, uh, that is what sparked this video idea. And uh, I, I highlighted a phrase that I used back then and that I used, I have been using since then, is this idea that there's no such thing as a first century Baptist. And this is one of the primary reasons I began to at least doubt my Baptist theology and, and consider uh, other forms of more historic ancient Christianity. And so I'm going to go through the argument in here in a little bit, but uh, this is this is integral to one of uh, this is integral to my conversion to the Catholic Church is this historical notion. It's a historical claim, uh, not necessarily a, an an exegetical claim. Uh, usually, when people talk about first century theology, they go to the New Testament, and that's what my practice was as, as a Baptist, and I. I just accepted the arguments that seemed valid uh, to me from an exegetical and uh, contextual basis, just looking at the text of the New Testament. And uh, as I slowly began to investigate the early church fathers in the Anti Antonicene period before the Council of Nicaea, and that's important because a lot of Baptists believe the Catholic Church began uh, with, with Constantine in 325. Besides the point, uh, these people who lived directly after the time of, apostle, of the apostles, looking into what they believed, led me away from believing that the first century held to certain Baptist beliefs, because it was my understanding as a, as a Baptist, as a, as a former Protestant, that the church, uh, th through a period of a, of a couple hundred years, slowly began to see intrusions of pagan theology and philosophy into the faith, and uh, the, the faith was, was corrupted. And so when you see later figures accepting regenerative baptism and, and other non-Baptist uh, beliefs, it's 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 fine. It's permissible because they were late, and there there's enough time for um, for that sort of corruption to take place. However, when you look at the early church fathers, and I don't want to get too ahead of myself, uh, it, it makes that historical claim pretty um, implausible. So. Anyways, this is my presentation about how there is no such thing as a first century Baptist uh, from a, a deductive kind of modus tollens argument of, of the historical data that we have. And so uh, first things first, I want to kind of go through what this video is not going to address. It's not going to address why Catholicism is more preferable over other ancient communions. Uh, I, this That could be a whole presentation in and of itself, and it actually has been. I definitely suggest uh, Michael Lofton at Reason and Theology and uh, some. I'll, I'll, I'll link some other resources in the comment section below. There's been plenty of books, plenty of, um, you know, Eric Ibarra's book, The Papacy, for example. Uh, there, there have been many, many works and arguments specifically dedicated to why Catholicism is pre preferable over other ancient communions. That's not the purpose of this uh, video here today. And it, this video also isn't going to address Baptist biblical arguments. I uh, mentioned before that a lot of the uh, Baptist arguments for what the new or for what the first century church believed are exegetical of the New Testament in, at their core. And uh, I would like to do a video specifically dedicated to Baptist biblical arguments for uh, particular theological positions and maybe even the even the two primary Baptist distinctives that I'm going to bring up later. Uh, I'd like to do videos specifically dedicated to those things, but I have a few other things that I want to kind of address at well. I want as well before I do those things. Uh, first and foremost, I don't want to address the Baptist biblical arguments for uh, their view on baptism before I do a reasons why uh, regenerative baptism video or an infant baptism video, so I can reference those videos uh, beforehand. 
And so those, those things I will not be addressing in this uh, presentation. But what I will be addressing and what we will be highlighting in this video are the historical issues with the claim that the first century church established by Jesus and the apostles believed in the two primary Baptist distinct, distinctives, that, that's supposed to be distinctives, not distinctions. And notice before I even go on, because I know there's going to be comments from people who are well-informed, uh, there are not just two primary Baptist distinctives, or there, there aren't just two Baptist distinctives. There's more uh, that makes up the Baptist identity than just these two beliefs. And the reason why I'm doing this is, first of all, I just kind of want to narrow it down for the presentation's sake. I don't want this video to be too long. Um, but I, I also think this is a far more generous definition of Baptist when we're considering something historically, uh, because I'm only requiring two of the, uh, I think, five or six Baptist distinctives that I've highlighted before. If you want to know a, a former Baptist take on what Baptists believe, uh, click the I at the top right hand corner. I did a video on that uh, specific. Specifically, and I, I mentioned some of the other distinctives that I've actually learned in my Baptist courses uh, at OBU. And so uh, these are the two primary Baptist distinctives that I'm going to be addressing and, and trying to see substantiated historically and, and uh, just kind of formulating uh, my argument against these two things particularly. So again, it's very general, which is far more generous uh, of a claim uh, or of, of a, um, I guess, distinction than uh, it would be to find uh, more than just two primary Baptist distinctives. So again, this would encompass more than just the Baptist denomination. Some Pentecostal denominations hold to very similar things. And if we just isolate just one of these two, a lot of other uh, Protestant denominations actually believe these things. So Let's just go ahead and go through what these two things mean very quickly. Uh, it's three claims about each topic or distinction. So they what they believe about baptism and what they believe about church governance. So uh, first and foremost, baptism is non-regenerative. That is the primary uh, thing about baptism, theological claim about baptism is that it does not save. It doesn't impart the forgiveness of sins. It doesn't uh, impart the Holy Spirit. It doesn't change anything within you. In fact, it is a sign of a change that has already occurred within Baptist theology. And I'm going to substantiate these claims soon from the 1689 London Baptist Confession, which many Baptist groups use. And it's, in fact, the first Baptist confession in history. Uh, as far as I'm aware, maybe I'm maybe one slipping my mind, but this is just the one that I picked to include in the next slides. So it doesn't save, baptism doesn't save. This already diverges from uh, the, the vast majority of Christians, uh, in fact, and that the only valid mode of baptism is immersion. This isn't as... Um, important of a theological claim, um, but you will see this in some of the Baptist confessions, and this is not, uh, for the record, what Anabaptists believe. Anabaptists believe in other modes other than, than immersion, and in fact, some of the early, early Baptist leaders baptized using other modes other than immersion, so I just thought I'd point that out. So some would dispute this, but you know, I included it here because it's in the confession. Uh, but this is, again, very tertiary. And it, it is very, um, a, it's an ahistorical claim. It's more ahistorical. Well, I wouldn't say more ahistorical, but it's, it's a secondary uh, issue uh, compared to non-regenerative baptism. And because baptism is non-regenerative, because regeneration is appropriated through a, a uh, individual's act of faith, towards Christ, since that's appropriated through um, someone being of the age of reason and converting to the faith, it, uh, baptism, and baptism symbolizes that change. It's for believers only. Only believers can be baptized because only believers are regenerated, and you're regenerated when you believe. And so since uh, baptism figures is a, is a figuration of uh, regeneration, then it ought to be administered after someone believes because that's when they are regenerated. So it's for believers only. But obviously, there is a hierarchy of uh, claims here. So non-regenerative is first, uh, believers is second, and then immersion, immersion only is like the third. Wow, that's a bad three. A third um, sort of third importance of these claims on baptism because uh, the, the the believers only is is really built on the theological conviction of non-regenerative uh, baptism. 
So that's what we're going to spend most of our time on. And then church governance, uh, going through this real quickly, autonomous congregationalism is the idea that there is no organizational structure above the uh, of, of divine institution above the local church that can impose its beliefs or um, practices on the local congregation. And the congregation is uh, governed, is self-governed by the congregation itself through democratic vote. And they say that this highlights the sovereignty of Jesus Christ more so than other um, church models. And so it's autonomous congregational church polity. And since there is no organizational structure above the local church, that means there's no bishop. And that means there are two offices. And really, these two offices are only delegated authority from the congregation as a whole. And even uh, it's the congregation's choice who will be the pastor and who will be the deacon. And a lot of times you have a board of deacons uh, in a, in a uh, pastoral search team and you want to hire a pastor who, who again, it's all uh, built upon the foundation of the authority of the congregation per autonomous congregationalism. So uh, again, there's other, there's other uh, denominations that would hold to one or two of these two primary distinctives. So we'll just leave it at that. So now we'll go to the 1689 London Baptist Confession. This is, again, just substantiating what I already claimed. Uh, This is just that uh, baptism is a sign is a sign of the things that have already happened. So it is non-regenerative. It's a sign of the things that uh, believers have already experienced. And, um, and it's, it's basically, it's, it's for believers only. So that's credo baptism. That's uh, non-regenerative baptism. And then immersion is, is a necessary, um, is a necessary aspect of baptism because of the administration of this ordinance. So those are the claims of, of baptism in the London Baptist Confession. Again, you can look at this website if you want to read more. It's actually a really well-formatted website. Uh, it's easily navigatable, and so you can find these pretty easily. That's in Chapter 29 of the 1689 London Baptist Confession on baptism. And then a uh, larger section on the church Main thing I want to highlight is that uh, usually in other forms of church governance, such as the Episcopal form of church governance, or uh, just just the form that Catholics and, and Orthodox use, when we say the church has made a decision on something, we typically mean the leaders of the church, so the hierarchy, the bishops uh, in union with the Pope in an ecumenical council makes decisions, uh, or or a local synod of bishops makes decisions, or um, you know that sort of thing. But when in the London Baptist Confession of Faith, uh, the church makes decisions, decisions, it is not the leadership, rather it is the church through a democratic vote. And, and so, and this is uh, chapter or section 13 is where um, the sovereignty of Jesus Christ is highlighted because Christ's, um, the, the, the proceedings of the church are meant to highlight and really, um, oh, what am I trying to say? Shine a light on the rulings of Christ in the scriptures so so far as they are in line with the scriptures, they would say. And so um, both doctrine and and uh, practice are, are going to be... Um, going to be ruled by the denomination. And again, there is no jurisdiction over the churches, uh, even if they're in a... Um, uh, convention. So the Southern Baptist Convention, they have the ability to disfellowship churches, but they don't have any authority over the local congregations themselves. So that's kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, but just to substantiate what I've already said about Baptists, what they believe, so that no one accuses me of uh, misconstruing their, their belief systems. And so let's go ahead and get into the argument itself. So uh, the premises are, are actually laid out and the conclusion is laid out. So uh, you can take a screenshot of this if you want, if you want to kind of study the points and and maybe even Baptists who are out there or non-Catholics or just people who disagree with me. Maybe if you uh, disagree with me, uh, kind of try and dispute, uh, show which of these, these premises and what specifically you dispute, because I know some of them, you know, I know which ones might be disputed uh, and, and the significance of each of these. But it's, as I said before, it's basically a modus tollens argument. It's, it's, a, it's a deduction from if this is the case, then this would be the case, but this isn't the case. So that first premise is not the case. So let's just go ahead and go through it. If the first century church 
including the apostles, believed the two primary Baptist distinctives, then they would be taught and passed on. So these Baptist distinctives would be passed on by the apostles and uh, passed on to the churches where they are establishing uh, churches, at establishing uh, congregations of believers. And uh, since, since the Baptists would make a case that it's taught in the New Testament, how much more would the apostles teach it through their oral preaching, especially in such elementary doctrines such as baptism and how the church is structured. So these things would definitely be taught and passed on. It's not like tertiary doctrines of it's, it's what does baptism do? Who is baptism for? Uh, how, how, does, how does baptism uh, come to be uh, practiced? In, in practicality uh, in, in the validity of, of such such practices so these are very important in, in elementary and sort of uh, what does Paul say they're, they're they're the milk and they're not the meat they're very they're very um, foundational but they're elementary it's it's something that you just have to get at, get down as a as a new believer so these are these are pretty uh, basic beliefs and so if this is true if the apostles, and just the church in general in the first century who received the New Testament. During the time the New Testament was written, if, if these people believed the Baptist distinctives, the two primary Baptist distinctives, then the Christians who lived immediately after this time, oh, where's my, my cursor? Then the Christians who lived immediately after that time would believe the same distinctives, okay? So, so I, I'm making, I'm making a, a judgment here. So the apostles teach the church the Baptist distinctives. They are so elementary, so basic to, to, to the foundation of Christianity. They're, they're so important uh, that they would be taught and passed on. And if those teachings are passed on, then the, then the Christians who lived right after the time of the apostles would believe the same distinctives. Who are you passing the doctrines on to if you are passing them on to the next generation? You are, you are passing them on to the next genera generation of Christians who lived immediately after that time. Ignatius, for example, Irenaeus, for example, Polycarp, for example, Clement of Rome, for example, all these people, early, early church fathers would believe those same distinctives, or if they didn't, they would at least dispute them or, or, or there would be some sort of argument or something. But if, if they were indeed established in their offices by the apostles, if they were taught those things by the apostles, uh, then they would believe the same distinctives. Then premise three, those Christians did not believe in the Baptist distinctives. It is abundantly clear, and this point is even reluctantly, I will say, conceded by many Baptist historians and theologians. And I, I say Baptist historians and theologians because uh, they, they just can't, they can't dispute it. Uh, I, I quote a few um, like non-Baptist historians, uh, J.D. Kelly's one uh, in this, and I, I also quote someone else, I'm pretty sure, Everett Ferguson, I believe. Uh, who aren't Baptists, who uh, would not dispute that uh, regenerative baptism is, is a universally held doctrine uh, from the very beginning. Uh, but the reason why I, I, I quote also a Baptist historian coming up is because uh, this, this, is, this is just not a disputable point. You have to think of a theory as to why this premise would be untrue, because this premise is indisputable. The Christians, the early Christians did not believe in the Baptist distinctives. So you have to come up with a theory as a Baptist as to why they would not believe uh, the, the same distinctives, even though baptism is such a fundamental doctrine. It's so elementary that it's just so easy to understand uh, from either perspective. And it, you know, it ought to be easy to understand because Paul calls it an elementary doctrine. Uh, and I keep referring to that. I'm pretty sure that's in 1 Corinthians. Uh, he, he says, although some of you should be teachers, uh, you're, you're still, you're still kind of struggling struggling on these elementary doctrines uh, about, about baptism and, and other things like that. So despite that point that the Baptists would have to dispute this premise, uh, those Christians didn't believe in the Baptist distinctives, and we would expect that they would. And uh, conclusion, the first century church was not Baptist either, because if the uh, Christians who immediately followed the time of the apostles did not believe uh, the Baptist distinctives, and in fact believed something completely uh, contradictory uh, uh, to the to the Baptist distinctives, it would follow that then those aren't things that the apostles passed on, and it comes to the question as to what did they pass on if not the Baptist distinctives? It would seem that they passed on a position that is uh, 
unreconcilable with the Baptist distinctives and, and even just diametrically opposed to the Baptist distinctives. And so, as I, as I said earlier, um, most historians would not dispute premise or point three. I don't know how, how the, the numbering of premises work. And again, I am being very modest and generous when it comes to what I would consider evidence for the Baptist tr position. I'm only requiring two distinctives. And uh, it's it just... It's just the case that no reputable scholar would argue from extra biblical historical documents that Christians living after the time of the apostles believed in non-regenerative immersion only credo baptism or autonomous congregational church polity with two church offices. Uh, now, there is uh, a, a dispute about the uh, development of the three tier hierarchical monarchical bishop, uh, bishopric. And uh, we can we can get into that, especially if we just do a whole video on it. I might just do that. I think I mentioned it a little bit uh, later on. Uh, but given the historical precedent for the Catholic view on these two subjects in those same time periods, uh, those who are well versed in the relevant sources typically emphasize their confidence, not in the historical data, but in the New Testament data uh, in, in their biblical arguments uh, to provide evidence that there was an a universal and practically undocumented shift from the Baptist to the Catholic view and uh, practice. So, for example, they say, well, it's clear from the New, the New Testament that baptism doesn't save, that baptism doesn't regenerate, that, that baptism is a mere sign of what happens when you uh, are, you become saved, and, and it ought to be. It's clear that it ought to be administered to believers only, and it's clear that from the, I don't know, from the, uh, the definition of the Greek word baptizo, that uh, immersion only is the the only valid mode of baptism yeah, or all, all of the, the different hoops that they jump through to substantiate such a clear New Testament teaching. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's really un unconvinc unconvincing uh, when you consider um, what or how long it took for people to believe these things about baptism uh, further if it's so convincing from the from the New Testament and no one believed it in the early church, then uh, that would pose some problems as to the um, credibility of the early church fathers. How can we trust them if they get such a basic doctrine wrong from the from the New Testament? And uh, do, do we assume they're ignorant? Then how can they be trusted with Christological issues? Or even uh, if the canon's correct, if their view of the canon's correct, are they handing on the right books? Um, there's just a whole host of issues. If if they're not ignorant, if they are uh, malicious, if they have malicious intent, then why do we trust them on anything, right? And so. That's that's why it's so important to investigate what the the apostolic fathers said because they they shed light on what the apostles handed down to be, to be believed by the church. You know, you look into the apostolic fathers as evidence for uh, the New Testament canon or the validity of of certain things happening. And so, um, you know, if if we can't trust them. And Joe Heschmeyer makes this point in the early church was the Catholic Church. I had this book on my on my shelf, very important if you want to kind of get into a, um, a really good book on the subject. And he makes a lot of similar arguments, but I figured I would uh, gear this specifically towards why uh, there's no such thing as a first century Baptist, because that uh, I think that is, is going to be a little bit more helpful. And obviously, I, I don't want to rip him off completely. Um, he, he makes some great arguments. Uh, in that book as to why the early church was the Catholic church, arguing with a lot of the same um, a, a lot of the same data that we're going to use in this book. So if you're interested, if you want to if you want to take some some more steps in investigating this issue, I definitely suggest Joe Heschmeyer, the early church with the Catholic church. I'm pretty sure that was 2021 publication. So recently uh, published. And so uh, if these if these uh, fathers are the direct descendants of the apostles. It's just, it's not like they're just, um, they're just early Christians who lived during that time period. A lot of them are actually uh, disciples of the apostles. A lot of them are actually instituted in their, in their leadership position by the apostles because they were faithful men who were able to pass on the faith as Timothy was, as Titus was. It really is troublesome when a particular doctrine is absent from the writings. I'm not saying it's an absolute defeater because arguments from silence are, are tricky. Uh, we might not have all the documents from a particular church father or theologian. We might not um, 
He might not thought it um, important or pertinent to address a particular topic. Um, so it's 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 acceptable in, in cer- certain circumstances. We shouldn't expect an absolute explicit uh, outline of every single important doctrine in, in the early church by an early church father. But it is overwhelmingly compelling uh, when a doctrine is not only unmentioned by the apostolic fathers, but it is explicitly contradicted by the positions which they universally held. So that is the case with these two Baptist distinctives. And so let me just go ahead and substantiate, if, just in case you don't believe me, just in case you haven't seen the data, let me just go ahead and substantiate this right here, this third point that I'm making with a couple different scholars uh, who who have spent their lives and careers uh, dedicated to uh, studying this sort of stuff in the early church. So first of all, Jandy Kelly, he's he's a very important scholar. Everyone likes to cite him. Uh, everyone has his books. So if you don't have Jandy Kelly early Christian doctrines, get it. It's on the fifth edition or something like that. Uh, it's it's a paperback on Amazon if you want to find it. But uh, this is what J.D. Kelly writes. From the beginning, baptism was the universally accepted right of admission to the church. It was always held to convey the remission of sins. That's regenerative baptism right there. That it conveys the, the remission of sins and mediated the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it was always held to convey the remission of sins. Oh, well, maybe he's biased. Maybe he's biased because he's an Anglican. I don't know what tradition Everett Ferguson uh, comes from. I'm pretty sure he might be Presbyterian or Anglican. Uh, but this is what he does. Uh, this is what he says in his book on the first five centuries of Christian theology when it comes to baptism. And so he's he's a uh, reputable scholar in this uh, discussion about what the, or the early church believed about baptism. This is a very important and popular uh, quotation to pull from him. In the first 500 years of Christian thought, there is a remarkable agreement on the benefits received in baptism. And these are present already in the New Testament text. So he does believe that uh, the New Testament teaches this for record. Uh, Two fundamental blessings are often repeated. The person baptized receives forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there are two separate scholars working on this. One is one wrote an entire work specifically dedicated to the issue of baptism. And so, as I mentioned a few slides ago, baptism being non-regenerative or regenerative is the primary theological claim that we need to uh, we need to investigate. And we have two scholars, non-Baptist, but we have two scholars saying from the very beginning, universally speaking, All the early Christians believed that these two benefits are received through baptism, forgiveness of sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That means baptism is salvific. If you receive the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit, that is is where you're justified. That's where you're regenerated. That's where where you're made a new creature. That is the new birth. And uh, if you want to read more, definitely suggest baptism in the early church. It's very dense, uh, but uh, the the section in Jane D. Kelly is kind of short. So... Whatever, if you if you wanna if you wanna spend the time on that uh, baptism in the early church, very I think it's pretty expensive too. Anyways, so the uh, as I as I told you guys, we're not just going to uh, consider non-Baptist historians. And the reason why I point out uh, Greg R. Allison is because first of all, he is a teacher at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary when I was still a Baptist. That is where I wanted to uh, go to school. He's he's a professor of theology, and he's been uh, he taught theology and church history for nine years at Western Seminary in Portland. And uh, he has a lot of experience. And he wrote, actually, he wrote my Baptist ecclesiology textbook. And that, where is that in? Uh, Sojourners and Strangers, the Doctrine of the Church. I actually have it right here. So this is where we're going to pull from. And uh, his his claims about and his concessions about what the early church uh, believed and, and taught and practiced. <clears throat> so, just thought I'd bring this up. Gregor Allison isn't just some liberal. He is a uh, professor of theology at a at a reputable conservative Baptist seminary, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Many, many people get their uh, theology degrees from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I know people at OBU who are going to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and, uh, and working on their master's degree or uh, MDiv. 
And so he is a reputable church historian, just so you know. Uh, and uh, so this is this is what what he concedes about baptism in the early centuries in this book. So if you're interested, uh, I, I don't know if they offer a paperback. I assume they would. But this is a very, very dense book. It's like about 500 pages. Um, and, and it goes to the biblical, historical, and just counter arguments and all that stuff. Very dense. I might do a few videos on this about the arguments that he makes in here. But this is what he has to concede uh, if, if he wants to be a reputable historian, if he wants to uh, engage objectively with the sources, this is what he concedes about baptism in the, in the early church. Putting together de the developing understanding of this rite according to the Didache, okay, so the Didache is, is probably one of, if not the earliest document outside of the New Testament that we have from the early church. Uh, it used to be the case that they believed, and, and actually um, Greg Allison, Dr. Greg Allison, believes it's still the case that the Didache was written during the mid to late second century, but it, it's now uh, the position of most historians and scholars that the Didache was actually written post 50 to late first century. That is so early on. It could have been written before half of our New Testament was put together. Uh, the Didache is a very, very important document to the early church. And um, I could go on and on about it, but the Didache is really important. It's pretty, it's fairly short, but it has a lot of claims about baptism, has a lot of claims about the practice of the early church and just the morality of the early church. And so he is um, objectively dealing with the claims of the Didache about what it says about baptism. This is what it says. So putting together this developing understanding of this rite in the early church, baptism served six purposes according to the Didache. The forgiveness of sins, deliverance from death, regeneration or the new birth, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the renunciation of Satan and identification with Jesus Christ. So he is conceding. Uh, I'll admit he does think the Didache was written during the second century. But even if we concede that, we, he is conceding that the earliest document that we have uh, uh, outside of the New Testament is, is uh, and, and I would say, I would, I would actually hold to the position that the Didache was written during the first century, um, explicitly supports regenerative baptism, explicitly denies his position on baptism. And if this were the case, if could you imagine if the apostles were teaching that baptism doesn't save, but this document, which, uh, mind you, achieved widespread acceptance immediately in the early church. If, if, if this was being like, like disseminated all, all across the Christian world during the time of the apostles or shortly thereafter, and no one said anything about it, and it, it like, that would be such an error to, to, to say that baptism saves that, that is such a huge elementary error to be disseminated across the entire Christian world and accepted by all Christians, especially if the apostles didn't fail in teaching about baptism. Let's go on. The Didache and baptism, again, likely written in the first century, possibly before much of our New Testament. Allison dates it to the early second century. That's disputed, but we're not going to get into that. Uh, and and this, this view about it being in the second century is a minority among historians today, and it continues to falter. But anyways, uh, we'll get off that, uh, that, that train of thought. Uh, but it achieved immediate widespread acceptance in the Christian community, as admitted by Dr. Allison. Remember, early, early document. It teaches the salvific significance of baptism. Six things, forgiveness, regeneration, Holy Spirit imparted through baptism. It teaches the salvific significance of baptism. It teaches that baptism is not non-regenerative. It is regenerative. But I also want to point out, because he doesn't actually mention this, that it teaches also the permissibility of other non-immersion modes of baptism, including a fusion. Okay, so if you look at the Didache, chapter 7, uh, verse 3, uh, it, it talks about the, uh, the ability and the validity of, of pouring water over the head three times in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It, it, it does, I will say this before anyone goes in the comment section, it does say that is, it is preferable, uh, full immersion is preferable, but uh, it, what, what it also says, it's not actually, uh, you know, completely 
uh, reconcilable to the Baptist position on this because it, again, it's permissible to do other modes. But the specific way that the Didache says that it is preferable to baptize is in running water in a cold river with full immersion in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's the preferable way. And if you don't have cold water, do hot water. If you don't have running water, do, do uh, they, they call it living water, do dead water. And if you don't even have that, then do a fusion. So it's talking about preferable modes, not valid modes, okay? So again, if, it, if this was written in the first century, this is an absolute defeater to the Baptist position uh, unless they want to say that uh, during the time of the apostles, everyone apostatized from the correct understanding of baptism, but then you're just going into Mormon land by then, and uh, it's, you just, you just, you got to, so many other dominoes fall because of that uh, position. I just don't think it's tenable to hold as, as a Baptist. So you have to come up with something. Um, I would suggest um, shedding the, the, your Baptist theology about baptism. So that is, um, ba- baptism regenerates. Baptism is able to be administered in, in more than one mode. Um, but you know, uh, we still have infant baptism. Okay. So can, can infant baptism be administered? And, and typically this is the topic that Baptists like to, um, at least from a historical standpoint, like to dispute. He spent a considerable amount of time in this book going through, uh, that argument about, um, infant baptism. But, but again, as I said before, if you remember baptism Gosh, where is it? The theology of regenerative baptism is the primary claim upon which everything else builds. And so if baptism is salvific, it would follow that it is permissible to administer this saving sacrament to the children of baptized believers who are going to raise their children in the faith, especially if it has saving effects like regeneration, impartation of the Holy Spirit, forgiveness of original sin and personal sin, but original sin if you're an infant. And so the, the usually, as I said, infant baptism is disputed, and I'll tell you why. This is a section from uh, Sojourners and Strangers. One of the most important developments in the early church's view of baptism was its switch, notice the language switch, that's unsubstantiated historically speaking, but its switch from baptizing people who could consciously participate in the rite, so believers, to baptizing infants. So there's, there's a claim. There was a switch from the right view to the wrong view very early on. At the end of the second century, Tertullian objected to involving children in baptism. This is the argument that many, many Baptists like to bring up. Sponsors standing in the place of infants promising to raise them as Christians could not and should not take place. Baptism should be administered later on in the children's life when they themselves became believers. And so the reason for the historicity of infant baptism baptism being disputed is because you can find individuals in the early church, such as Tertullian, uh, advocating for the delay of baptism. And I actually don't think that, um, oh, I, I did include a slide here. Uh, th- this, this, this assessment of what Tertullian uh, believed is highly inaccurate for multiple different reasons. I don't think I, I did not include a, um, a quotation from Tertullian. So let's go ahead and bring that up in Logos since I have this up. And before we go to Tertullian's arguments and get in the weeds a little bit, let me just summarize this a little bit. So advocating for the delay of baptism is never on the grounds that Baptists give. Never. So even outside of Tertullian, it's never on the same grounds that Baptists give. Uh, It's not because they are disputing, these early church writers are disputing the validity or efficacy of infant baptism. Their basis for arguing that baptism should be delayed is because it imparts the forgiveness of sins and regeneration. Okay, so they're arguing on the same basis that people advocating for infant baptism do uh, on the basis that it regenerates. So what, what they would say is they need to, infants need to delay their baptism until they understand what happens in baptism and understand the promise they're making in baptism so that 
after they've already sinned, after they understand this, after they understand the commitment that they're making in baptism, they can receive baptism. They get more sins forgiven in baptism if it's delayed, right? And that's actually what happened to Constantine. Constantine delayed baptism until his deathbed because it was a practice among some Christians, not all Christians, uh, in, in certain areas, to delay baptism as long as possible so that when you receive baptism, you're like a newborn baby. All of your sins are forgiven. And uh, so this this is obviously an error because you can't receive uh, the Eucharist if you're not baptized. And uh, it's it's very dangerous. It's you're, you're presuming on God's mercy at that point if you delay baptism. But uh, to delay baptism, nonetheless, in, in Tertullian's view, is to increase the amount of sins that are washed away. And so now let's get into Tertullian and what he says on baptism. So if you notice in chapter 18 on the of the persons to whom and the time when baptism is to be administered, let's just hone in here. And so according to the circumstances and disposition and even age of each individual, the delay of baptism is what? Necessary because infants can't be baptized validly? No, it's preferable. Principally, however, in the case of little children. For why is it necessary if baptism itself is not so necessary that the sponsors likewise should be thrust into danger? Who both themselves by reason of mortality may fulfill or f- may fail to fulfill their promises and may be disappointed by the development of an evil disposition in those for whom they stood. The Lord does indeed say, forbid them not to come to me. Let them come then when they are growing up. Let them come while they are learning, while they are learning whether to come. Let them become Christians when they have become able to know Christ. Why does the innocent period of life hasten to the remission of sins? So his argument for the delay of baptism as to why it's preferable isn't because infant baptism is invalid. It's because more forgive more forgiveness will be meted out, more sins will be forgiven if you delay it longer. If if they get, if they know what they're talking about, the sponsors won't be put in danger because they have this responsibility to make sure that the child is going to be growing up in the faith. They have this responsibility, and that responsibility is better, uh, according to Tertullian is better um, exercised when the child is older. So the second Baptist distinctive is church governance, and this is what he concedes in his book, uh, immediately following the writings of Scripture around 100 to 115 A.D., the monoepiscopacy, so one ruling bishop, was being encouraged by church leaders such as Ignatius. This is a very, very mild term, and, and actually it's inaccurate. We're going we're gonna to talk about that in a little bit by a leader such as Ignatius. And at this time, the threefold ministry of bishop, presbyter, and deacon became well-established. At what time? It was it was well-established in the church. At what time? 100 AD, immediately following the writings of Scripture. This is a huge, and I, I don't see why he doesn't see it, this is a huge issue for Baptists because you do not see a single lick of evidence that the early church switched somehow from a congregational church polity, an autonomous congregational church polity, to all of a sudden monoepiscopacy with a threefold ministry, threefold uh, church offices, okay? Um, you, 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 you can, and I'm going to talk about um, the two offices versus three offices in a, in a different video because there's a whole argument that goes there. But it's, it's inaccurate uh, for, for many different reasons. First of all, he claims that Ignatius introduced or encouraged the threefold hierarchical structure of bishop, priest, deacon, and elevated, he said it was elevated the office of bishop over that of elder. This is very, very inaccurate. Ignatius assumed in his writings, he didn't encourage, he didn't introduce, he didn't elevate, he didn't, he, this isn't, this isn't something that St. Ignatius is, is uh, giving to the church, he is assuming that the structure was essential to the church. Why? Because he says, without bishop, priest, deacon, you don't have a church. Without the bishop, you don't have a church, right? And so he wrote to other churches where a three-tiered hierarchy was already established. He was writing to the, he, he named bishops by name. And he wasn't telling the others, he wasn't making an argument as to why this should change to a different uh, church governmental structure. He was describing an already existing reality in 100 to 115 AD. 
So if that was an already existing reality in multiple different churches spread throughout the land, if this, if this is an assumption that Ignatius is making, that without the threefold hierarchy of bishop, priest, deacon, you don't have a church, if this is an assumption St. Ignatius has made, is, is making, and he is the disciple of the Apostle John, he was instituted in, in Antioch by uh, the recommendation of Peter, as, as many traditions say, then uh, it's either the apostles were completely ignorant as to uh, the the uh, ability of St. Ignatius to actually pass on the faith um, in, in the other churches, what they were doing, you know, like this is this is such a huge error. So it's either the apostles didn't do a very good job in establishing a uh, autonomous congregational church polity uh, with, with only two church offices, or, or the Baptist interpretation of the New Testament is wrong. First century Christians actually didn't practice or believe these things. And the apostles just established the the church governmental structure that was immediately present following the time of the New Testament uh, writings. It, it just makes so much more sense to to uh, conceive of a continuity between the first and second century, the late first and early second century, uh, especially if the scriptures can be interpreted in that uh, fashion, than it is to uh, contrive of some huge and universal break from what the church taught you know, and so it, 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 undocumented at that. So uh, this is what Ignatius says in his epistle to the Tralians. In like manner, let all reference the deacons as an appointment of Jesus Christ and the bishop as Jesus Christ, who is the son of the father and the presbyters as the Sanhedrin, I think that might be a typo, of God and assembly of the apostles. Apart from these, there is no church. Apart from what? Bishop, presbyters, deacons. Apart from these, there is no church, okay? So he's assuming that that these things are an essential aspect of the church. And if you don't have these things, well, you're, you're not even a part of it. You're not even a part of a church. So there, there, are, there, are, so many, there are so many issues with the Baptist explanation of post-apostolic church history. The dispute of the um, continuity between the first and second century church. Allison makes these two assessments about what the first century Christians believe and their, their shift to the second century uh, church because of a prior commitment to an, an anachronistic reading of the New Testament. Why do I say anachronistic? Because no one believed what he believes about baptism for 1,500 years. No one practiced autonomous congregationalism for 1,500 years. So he is anachronistically reading his, his theology and practice into the New Testament and then contriving of this universal break and shift from, from what the New Testament supposedly teaches to the, the uh, universal uh, view of church governance and baptism for the next 1,500 years. And so the New Testament... Another reason why this is so uh, there's so many issues with it is because the New Testament does not describe in particular details about how a church ought to be established and governed because it's not a manual for ecclesiology. It's written to already established churches, not to established churches. Okay, so he, he, no New Testament writer establishes establishes a church by writing a New Testament letter on how to establish a church on how things should function, okay? They're, they're, they're writing to correct already established churches. They assume they already know what they're talking about, they already know what they should be doing, and they're correcting them, okay? And they're, they're expounding certain things. So if the New Testament were as clear about, because you'd, you'd have to assume that the New Testament is so clear about baptism, it is so clear about what you should do as a church, if it was so clear as Baptists like Allison, Dr. Allison, like to think it is regarding autonomous congregationalism or, or even baptism, then you would expect anyone, anyone to mention this practice in the early church, especially if the apostles handed these elementary doctrines are uh, on uh, directly. It's not like some tertiary, secondary doctrine that depends on other doctrines. These are elementary, fundamental doctrines. So he's relying completely on his exegesis of the New Testament text, which uh, on, the, on the principle of sola scriptura has, has been interpreted in many different ways, including Episcopalianism, including Presbyterianism, including Congregationalism, and other uh, kind of weird uh, views of how the church ought to operate on how uh, those things ought to operate. Uh, so he's relying completely on his ability to exegete, exegete the scriptures in that way and on the fact that every Christian was wrong for 1,500 years uh, because there's no historical evidence that a single, as I said before, that a single early church, 
early Christian group practice a congregationalist approach to church governance. That's that's just a historical fact. So when I was a Baptist, I had to contrive of, and I it didn't have to be completely consistent because I, I wasn't I wasn't very knowledgeable what the early church believed in practice. I, I had to to contrive of a reason why this this universal sudden uh, apostasy from these two elementary doctrines and practices would occur. And there is no cohesive uh, coherent theory as to why that would occur. Now to the issue that I'm sure a lot of Baptists are screaming uh, from, from at the top of their lungs about. So the issue of two or three offices uh, in in the New Testament is a um, is something that Baptists often bring up and emphasize in this discussion about um, is it congregationalism? Is it is it Episcopalianism? What has more historical or New Testament uh, evidence? And, and the reason being is because, and I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's it's because in the New Testament, there seems to be uh, a, a, a case in which the term for uh, presbyter or elder, pres, presbyteros, wow, this is the last time I'm going to be writing in uh, with, with, a, with a mouse on the screen because that looks horrible. Presbyteros, so uh, that term and... Uh, Oh, what is it? Episcopos. These two terms, they would say, are practically interchangeable in the New Testament. And so it's it's a better case that could be made in favor of a part of uh, Baptist ecclesiology. But I, I do think it's still un- unconvincing. Uh, because they would say that there's a switch from having a two-church office model elder deacon uh, because presbyteros would be, that w- that's elder and uh, bishop. Those things are, if they are equal to each other, then it's elder slash bishop deacon uh, to having a three-tier bishop elder deacon uh, model. And so there, I don't have time to address this in this video and I would like to spend a lot more time um, kind of, <clears throat> hashing out the differences and, and hashing out the reasons why people believe this. Uh, it's it's not absolutely pertinent because again, um, in either case, congregationalism is not being practiced. And so uh, at the end of the day, you, you can be you can be like even a Lutheran who believes that there are two divinely instituted offices, but uh, the there there is one divinely instituted elder uh, among other elders that might be elevated to, to a practical position by a uh, human uh, institution uh, so that it would seem like there are three offices. And I, I'd have to kind of look through the Lutheran confessions. I don't know if it mentions this, um, but there, in reality, there are two divinely revealed offices. And in practicality, you do have one of those presbyters uh, being elevated, not in authority, but in just uh, role. So you you do have bishops in in the LCMS in other Lutheran churches, and I know that opinion kind of. Uh, I've talked to Peyton about it a little bit, so I don't want to get too much in the weeds there. But at the end of the day, um, even if you concede this, uh, congregationalism is not being practiced, and so we will um, address this in a a future video. Um, and we will address some of the comments made by Justin Martyr and, uh, uh, no, not Justin Martyr, uh, Jerome. And, uh, yeah. So anyways, uh, that, that is, that is sort of getting into the weeds. Other people have done a little bit of work on this. Uh, but just, just so I don't leave you, uh, in the, leave you in the weeds, I will tell you, uh, a a common answer given by Catholic apologists and just given by people who are making a theory as to why there is this sort of equivocation between presbyteros, presbyteros and episkopos in the New Testament. And it's because during the New Testament time period, uh, these terms did not have a specific meaning yet. And so a lot of times you'll have uh, elders being called overseers or o- overseers being called elders or even apostles being called mere elders or even apostles being called deacons. And you you have this 
interchangeability, not because there is only two offices, but because the terms to refer to the offices that are established do not have a set term to refer to them yet. And so um, as, as time goes on, we do tend to require a more specific meaning of terms. And that's why the confusion arises, because uh, in the New Testament, oftentimes they use terms in a in a looser sense than we're we're wanting them to be because uh, they're still sort of trying to figure out how to um, talk about certain things so anyways the the loose language in the New Testament if if we're taking every single reference of presbyteros or episcopos or diakonos as referring to the office of elder bishop deacon uh, then we do get bigger issues such as apostles being called deacons other people called deacons other people called presbyteros and uh and and, and stuff like that so anyways that's in the weeds but uh just just briefly to kind of sum up what i've been saying uh, I, I, I definitely think that the early church knows better about what the early church uh, believed and what happened in the early church than those who discard their witness in favor of a suspect interpretation of the scriptures. And so what I mean by that is the early church has a witness about what people believed in practice in the early church, going back to the time of the apostles. They know better. They are in a better position to know about what happened than people who do not take their witness as a um, as a as a determinative factor as as to what they believe in, in, in favor of what they think the scriptures believe, and so it just doesn't make sense that they were wrong about such elementary, fundamental topics such as baptism and uh, the the church governance. And if we think they were wrong, why should we trust them for other things such as the can of scripture or a whole host of other things in Christianity? We rely on the the early church fathers for a whole bunch of stuff. And so, uh, and secondarily, actually, this should be primarily: how do we make sense of Christ's promise about the Holy Spirit to guide the church into all truth? if the the church lacks the truth completely and in fact accepts a um, deception about baptism universally for 1500 years, I just, I can't see it. I I, I just can't see it. So if if their their judgment on baptism, something as simple as baptism can be wrong, why do we think we can trust them? And why do we we trust Jesus's words about the Holy Spirit uh, when such an elementary thing, uh, such an elementary uh, doctrine is denied and substituted. So that is the end of this presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you have any questions or comments or concerns, let me know in the comment section below. Uh, section below. Uh, just just to sum things up, doubting the historical validity of Baptist theology is one of the main reasons I began to investigate Catholicism, and it can be for you too. If you're a Baptist or you hold to one of these distinctives, I hope you guys enjoyed, and I hope that by my learning the faith, your faith will be strengthened as well. Have an amazing day, and we'll see you guys next time.